uh, Detroit in time to teach last Wednesday night. I appreciated Alex filling in. I, uh, anytime you, the pilot doesn't want to fly, you probably don't want to either. And he decided, after we'd all got on the airplane, he decided that, that uh, he didn't want to fly the airplane. There was a mechanical problem. And I decided, hey, I'm happy to get off, and I would be happy and cheerful that they found it before we took off. And so coming back from Maine yesterday, we got back last evening, and when we left Portland, we had to say we were late getting out because the plane coming in had had a problem. And uh, so, you know, when they have problems, you're happy that they find them on the ground. At least I'm, I am. And uh, so, you know, you, you best best laid plans of mice. I appreciate Alex filling in last week. So we're back to Zechariah chapter 5. Now, this chapter has two visions in it. And they're rather, frankly, rather confusing and dark visions. They are different from everything else that's been here in Zechariah so far. These first uh, chapters have these eight vision, night visions that Zechariah sees. And these, these last three uh, seem to be extremely confusing to commentators. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you folks, people uh, on the Internet might know. Uh, there's a fellow down in Florida, a Baptist teacher, uh, Dr. Peter Ruckman. And Dr. Ruckman wrote some commentaries through the years. And he, did, he, he kept, when he wrote a commentary on the book of Zechariah, he kept saying, I didn't want to write this because there's stuff in Zechariah I don't know anything about. And when he gets to Zechariah chapter 5, he says, this chapter, nobody knows anything about it. <laughs> and consequently, anybody, you can always tell somebody who's teaching Zechariah uh, how much contact they've had with Peter Ruckman by the fact that they'll, they'll constantly say, well, you can't figure this out. You don't know it. Because if Doc didn't know it, nobody can know it. And I, I've noticed through the years, people that, you know, they, they'll, they'll repeat, when you hear people saying those, that, that kind of thing about a chapter like this, and about this chapter in particular, uh, it's always somebody that's following Dr. Ruckman. And that's not, a, that's not a bad thing, that's just a kind of a thing you don't grow beyond what he didn't know. It, it's, th- this chapter is, it's, it's, it's an interesting chapter in the sense that he doesn't give you, a, all of a sudden, he doesn't give you a lot of, of information to help you interpret what's going on. And that's why, the, that's why the idea is that it's hard to understand, is that he doesn't give you a lot of extraneous information that allows you to, to understand things. That isn't because he's trying to hide it, by the way. The reason for that, it seems to me, is that by this point, I mean, you've been through, this, this is going to be the, 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 uh, the sixth vision, the seventh vision and the eighth vision, at this point, Zechariah expects you, the reader, his readers, uh, to be able to understand these things for themselves. They, you already have enough information to understand these. If you, ever go, if you go into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the Lord Jesus Christ began to speak in parables, starts in Matthew 13, and prior to that he spoke very plainly, but now there's, there, there's this... Uh, uh, rejection of him that's taken place. The first stated plot to kill him is in, is in uh, Matthew 12. That's when he says, the greater the prophet, the greater priest, the greatest, greater king is here, and you've rejected him. Then in Matthew 13, he goes outside of the house, picture of leaving Israel, goes out and sits by the, by, by the seaside, and he begins to give what are called the mystery parables of the kingdom. And when he began to speak in parables, he did it not, every preacher you hear, uh, every, not ever, but Obviously, not all of them, but generally speaking, you hear people say Jesus was told stories and told parables in order to make it easy for people to understand what he said. He said it was the opposite. He says they they asked why do you why why are you teaching us in parables now? We don't understand these things. He said because it's for you to understand and for them not to. So I'm putting it in veil language so only believers can understand it. And then when he, he gave them seven parables in Matthew 13, he interpreted the first two for them. And Mark 4, when he did it, he says, I'm going to interpret these for you so you will have a template by which you can inter- interpret all the rest of them. So he didn't interpret all the parables. He just taught them how to interpret them. 
and then they, they would be able to go on. Well, that's sort of what's going on here in Zechariah. It isn't that he's trying to hide it from you, or from Israel particularly. And by the way, I love what uh, Brother Down in Texas uh, always says about this stuff. If, 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 what we're, if when we study prophecy, if we don't get it right, it doesn't matter. We won't be there anyway. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> After the rapture, what happens on the earth? If, if I don't have it all right, and I can guarantee you I don't, uh, it ain't going to make a big difference. Uh, we won't be here, and they're not going to be listening to us anyway. So uh, anyway, that, that's, but as we, as we try to read it and study it and understand it, it, it isn't because he's trying to hide it from us. It's because there's, you have enough information at this point to understand these last three visions. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. That's the first, and by the way, that's, that's the other thing that we, when you hear uh, Dr. Ruckman said, this chapter is full of flying uh, UFOs, unidentified flying objects, because he doesn't know what they are, and he says, therefore, they're unidentified, and there's a, the, the, the flying roll and then the flying ephah in a little while. And he says, so this is, and that's about all they ever get out of that, this chapter. And, and that's... <laughs> I listened to that, and I said, well, okay, there are no unidentified flying objects in this chapter because they're all identified. There are some flying objects, but they're not UFOs. So all that, all that stuff that people do uh, and that kind of stuff, you know, I, it, it's fun to talk about it, and it's better to study the verses and understand what they say. The first vision, the, this is the sixth vision, is about this flying roll. And what you're going to see here is the fact that God's going to judge. He's going to curse sin. They've broken the law, and the curse of that broken covenant is not going to be left undealt un, un, uh, with. Then there's going to be the seventh vision, with the, the, uh, the ephah, and that's a, that's a real strange one. And it, it really doesn't fit sort of the pattern of what's going on here. The first five visions were, were, were full of uh, uh, hope, the kingdom, the restoration. Then these last four visions, uh, they're, they're not so much that way. They focus more on vengeance and wrath. So we're going to see that here. Let me just read it for you, the first four verses, because if you, you're going to need to get it in your head to go back over it. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. Now, <laughs> okay, makes sense. The length thereof is twenty cubits, and the breadth thereof ten cubits. Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. You see how that's not hard to understand that? What is it? I see a flying roll. It's twenty cubits wide, it's 10 cubits long, it's a big thing, and he says, okay, let me tell you what that is, this is the curse that goeth over the whole face of the whole earth, okay, that's pretty easy to understand that, so this is not unidentified, you know what it is, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth, for everyone that stealeth shall be cut off, as on this side, according to it. And everyone that sweareth shall be cut off on that side according to it. In other words, the scroll is written on both sides. And on one side it talks about, being a, about, about stealing. And everybody that's broken those, that commandment is going to be cursed. And on the other side it talks about swearing. And that swearing, if you look down in the next verse... I will bring it, I will bring it the curse forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. So when he talks about swearing there, he's not talking about, you know, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, no, nothing but the truth. He's talking about swearing in, in, a, in an oath of allegiance to God, and then he's talking about blasphemy, swear, sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall Consume it uh, with the timbers thereof and the stones thereof. So that's that's a interesting thing for Zechariah to have seen. 
And it's not, it's, it's uh, well, it's sort of self-interpreting. I lifted up mine eyes, uh, I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. Now, when he says it's, <clears throat> it's a roll, that's not talking about a biscuit or a dinner roll. That's talking about a book, like a scroll. Come, come with me to um, uh, the book of Ezra, chapter number 6. And you remember the Ezra, Zechariah, the, these are all basically contemporary kind of people after the, after the captivity. But when he talks about a, a roll, he's talking about an official document. Uh, Ezra chapter 6, Then Darius the king made a decree... And search was made in the house of the rolls, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. And there was found at Akmetha, in the palace that is in the province of the Medes, a roll. Therein was a record thus written. So the roll, it's a scroll. It's a, it's a roll a book that's rolled up into a scroll. What we're talking about is a, like I said, it's not a, you know, we ate supper last night and said, would you like some rolls? It's not that. We're talking about a scroll. We're talking about a book. And we're talking about an, a book that is an official document. Now, the book is identified for you. And if, if you look at the, the next verse, then he said unto me, Zechariah 5, 4, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. Well, when he says this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth, what is it that brings a curse? It's the law. The law brings a curse. The broken law, maybe I should say. Look back with me at Deuteronomy chapter 28. Uh, make it 27, I think, Deuteronomy. You remember the, the curses that, of Leviticus 26? You keep the law, keep my covenant, I'll bless you. You don't keep my covenant, I'll curse you. Leviticus 26, verse 27. I'm sorry, 26, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, forget Leviticus. Okay, Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. Everything else I said, forget. Deuteronomy 27, the very last verse. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And all the people shall say amen. That curse comes from breaking the law. So the flying roll contains the curse. The roll is going to be the word of God. It's going to be... The, uh, the, the God, God's message to them. If you come back with me to Jeremiah chapter 36, you'll notice that that's, a, it, it's, that's how God's word was uh, available to them. Jeremiah chapter 36. It's just an illustration. It came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel. Notice you've got to take the, the, the roll of a book. And that's, that's, what's, that's the, the, the deal here. Verse 4, Then Jeremiah called Barak, the son of Neriah, and Barak wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. So what, what Zechariah is seeing is a roll of a book. He's, looking, he's seeing the word of God. And in that word of God is the law. And if you go back to Zechariah chapter 5, specifically what's there is the law, the broken law, the curse of the law. This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. Now, by the way, the idea of it being a flying roll, you notice in verse uh, 2, 
2. He said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, A flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits. The breadth thereof is 10 cubits. A cubit is, is, uh, is the measurement between the end of your finger to your elbow. Is generally considered, the cubit of a man is generally considered to be 18 inches. So this thing, if it's 20 cubits, it's going to be a little over 30 feet. Okay? And if it's 10 wide, it's going to be 18 feet wide. So you've got, a, you've, you've got this roll that's gigantic, and it's flying. And where is it flying? Well, it's flying over the land of Palestine. Now, why would you have a big roll, a big copy of the Scripture flying in the... Hey, the last time we were down, just a couple weeks ago, we were down at uh, Navy Pier with some people, and there was an airplane flying up by, and you've seen them, and they're pulling a banner behind them. And I'm watching it. It's way too... It, we're at Navy Pier, and it's, it's down beyond Navy uh, uh, Soldier Field, but it's turning around. It comes back. And it comes right over. And you know, all of a sudden you see the sign and you read it. And you know how you just can't, you're watching it and you can't see it. You just wait for it to get there. <laughs> this thing is flying in the air for them to read. And it's big and gigantic, so it'll be easy to read. Look back at Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. It's just like this kind of thing. Habakkuk 2 verse number 2. The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. The idea is put it in a big billboard fashion that people can see it plainly. Because when they see it, get the message, then they can run and do the message. So the idea of the flying roll, this, this is not designed to be some spook show or some Star Wars thing where there's a flying saucer or a flying banana or something out there. It's not to be a, a UFO. This is a, pic, this is a vision of how God's Word is going to be plac, placard before His people, and they're going to be accountable to it. Now, if you notice in verse 3, the curse... And this is a fascinating thing about the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. This, and the earth here, when he talks about the whole earth, he's not talking about Chicago or Maine or California. He's talking about the whole earth in the Middle East. He's talking about the land of Palestine. All of the land of the Middle East is going to hear this message. Everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it, and everyone that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. So it's written on both sides. Look back with me at Deuteronomy. I'm sorry, Exodus. I, Exodus 32. When God gave the commandments to Moses, Exodus chapter 32, verse number 15 Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both sides. On the one side and on the other were they written. They were written with the finger of God. So when he gave the law, he wrote it on both sides. Now you'll remember that the law is in basic, it really is in two Sections. The first four commandments talk about what their relationship with, with God. Have no other gods before me, no graven images, don't take the name of the Lord God in vain, and so forth. They were about then you start the last six had to do with their relationship with one another. Don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't that kind of thing. So what does he do? Well the first one is don't don't thou should not steal. So he, he's taking those that that side of the law. And then he says, thou should not swear, don't take the name of the Lord, don't, don't blaspheme, um, swear falsely in my name. That's the, you know, one is the fourth commandment, one's the eighth commandment. And so he's, he's got the balance, and that's why it's through the, the two sides. But those two specific sins are, are identified, not just because they represent the two parts of the law, the two sides of the law, 
Those two specific sins are, are specifically identified because those two specific sins are going to be, they, they, they focus on the, on the Antichrist policy, the satanic policy in the last days against the believing remnant in Israel. When he says, the, um, everyone that stealeth shall be cut off. Jesus said that, come with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not in by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as what? A thief and a robber. Well, who is it that's trying to climb up the other way? Well, it was the Pharisees. It was the vain religious system in Israel. They were trying to get the blessings without coming God's way. And he said, you're a thief and a robber. When they swear falsely in my name, they blaspheme. Revelation chapter 13 says about the Antichrist that his mouth was full of blasphemies against God. These are the, character, these, these are the special sins that are going to be used in the, in the seduction policy against the nation Israel to try to destroy the, nation, the, the little flock in Israel and the nation itself. So those, those, those specific sins, the reason they're listed here is because these, are, the, the, these sins are specific things that the Antichrist and his followers are, and their tactics are going to use against the little flock. And you notice how he says in verse 3, this is the curse that shall go forth over the, fa and, and, over the face of the whole earth. Come back with me to Malachi chapter 4. And when, you, when you're looking at this thing, and I, I'm saying the, these particular things because by the time you get here in Zechariah 5, these are the kind of things that ought to be rolling around in your mind when you read these, the, these verses. When he talks about the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. That's what this flying roll, here's, the mess, here's this curse that God's word has pronounced on the vain religious system that has captured the nation Israel and all the people that are involved in it. Malachi chapter 4, verse number 5. The, here's the last thing that you read in your Bible in the Old Testament. Be, verse, uh, Malachi 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and notable and great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now think just for a second. Before the second advent, Elijah's going to come. Who did we just read about in Zechariah chapter 4? You remember those two branches? Those two witnesses? Those two olive trees? Those two olive branches? Those two witnesses? Revelation chapter 11, one is Moses, one is Elijah. So right there in Zechariah 5, you just read a couple of verses before about Elijah coming. So Malachi says, Elijah's coming. Now verse 6. And he shall return the heart of the father to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. If you don't listen to those witnesses in Zechariah 4, what's going to happen? He's going to smite the whole earth with a curse. You see the connections in that? This stuff is, is, is not just freestanding. It's not just there to, no, what is that? Well, it must be a UFO. It's not that kind of stuff at all. There's plenty of information here to figure out what's going on. We're talking about, and by the way, you notice when he says in verse 2, I see this flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. Come back to 1 Kings chapter number 6. That ought to, when you're familiar enough with these things in, in, your, in, 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 your, in your thinking, you would ask yourself, why in the world would he tell me how big the thing? He could, say, he could have said it was big. 
Why did he give me the measurements? And when he gave me the measurements, why did he give me those measurements? Well, if you, didn't, if you weren't really familiar with the history of Israel, you could get a concordance and look it up. It would be better to be familiar with it. By the way, <laughs> I'm afraid to ask, how many of you started reading three chapters of Paul's epistles a day? Some of you. I won't ask the rest of you that didn't raise your hand. I made this statement last uh, week in Maine. I, I, I just, in an offhand manner, I, I uh, made this statement Friday night. And Monday, while we were going with some people, he told me, he said, you know, I started Friday night when I went home reading three chapters. <laughs> and he said, wow, it's fun. And I said, well, yeah, you know, six chapters would be more fun. <laughs> nah, don't push it, Rick. Okay. <laughs> But what you do is you, is you try to get the things in your mind. And he, in fact, he, I've, had, I've had a half dozen people, more than that actually, email me or face, uh, message me and say, how do you read? What, what are your reading habits? Well, mine shouldn't be yours, and I do differently than what I would recommend you do. But if you just read, somebody said, well, do you, when you read, do you study? When you read... No, just read. Just reading gets it into your mind. Then when you study, you've got all that stuff floating around in there. Now here's a cross-reference that, that you could have found easily. When he says it's the, the, that the measurements are 20 cubits and 10 cubits, when Solomon built the temple... 1 Kings 6, verse 2, the house which, Solomon, which King Solomon built for the Lord, the length thereof is three score cubits, and the breadth thereof 20 cubits, and the height thereof 30 cubits. Wow, look at all them. Hey. <laughs> Somebody asked me, on you said, what do you yell at? What do you wave at? I'm yet waving at all the children and the young people going through the back. Hey, there you go. <laughs> they have fun. You know, it gives you a break, too. Three square cubits, and uh, then the height. The porch, the porch before the temple of the house, 20 cubits was the length thereof according to the breadth of the house, and 10 cubits was the breadth thereof before the house. So the porch on the temple is exactly the same size. You know what you do with a porch? My wife always wanted to have a house with a porch. We stayed in a hotel, in a, in a b and in Maine, got this beautiful porch, looking out over a blueberry field, looking at a big woods of beautiful colors. You know what we did with the porch? We'd get up in the morning, go out and sit on the porch. It was beautiful. The porch is where you go watch stuff, where you go see stuff, where you would, where you would put the handbills. This scroll is like it's there, and it's going to remind them, if they're thinking, about the temple. Well, there's something very special going on in Israel in connection with the last days, in connection with the satanic policy of thieving, stealing from the people, God's word from the people, and blasphemy, speaking blasphemy against him, that's going to cause the curse to go out through the whole land that has to do with the temple. Look at Second Sam, Second Chronicles chapter number 4. My point is that the, the, the flying scroll, even in its dimensions, points them to the temple. Second Chronicles chapter 4, verse number 1. Moreover, the, he, he made an altar. This is again talking about Solomon. He made an altar of brass, 20 cubits the length thereof, 20 cubits the breadth thereof, and 10 cubits the height thereof. I just point out, again, here's the altar. Where? In the temple. What is it that the Antichrist is going to assault? Where is he going to declare himself to be God? Where is he going to speak the great swelling words of blasphemy? It's all going to be related to the temple. So here comes God's word. And when you violate the law, the covenant, you break it, 
there's a curse coming, and it's going to consume the whole land. Verse number 4, he says, I will, I will bring it forth, the curse, saith the Lord of hosts. It's going to go forth over the face of the whole earth. This thing's going to cover the whole of the Middle East. And it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. They think they're doing it and getting away with it. And he says, I'm going to send this curse. And it's going to pursue them into their house. Not just pursue them down the street. It's going to go home with them. It's going to follow them. It's going to pursue them into their house. And it's going to consume them. And it's not just going to consume them. It's going to consume it, the house, with the timbers thereof and the stones thereof. It's literally going to consume them and their homes and the building material that the house is made out of. Now, that's quite a curse. <laughs> He's literally going to take the whole of them out completely. The only thing in the Bible that I know of that's like that, can you think of something like that? Say it again. Well, the... <laughs> I'm talking about in the Bible. <laughs> well, but that, but that, that's a good illustration of the Napa Valley fires. It's exactly, I'll show you a verse in a minute, it's exactly what's happening. You remember when God put the tenth plague on Pharaoh? The death angel's going to come into all the houses of, 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 that don't have the blood on the post. If you're not under the blood, that's it. William Tyndall coined a term to describe that event. He called it the Passover. When you read about the Passover in your Bible, that's a term that William Tyndall in the 1500s, when he translated the Bible into English, coined to describe that event. And it comes out of Exodus 12, 13, when, when God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over them. But what he was doing is there was this death angel pursued Pharaoh, that Assyrian usurper who was seeking to destroy Israel. The same kind of thing is going to happen here. And the curse that's going to come upon them when it comes is going to come, it's going to go forth from the Lord. There's, by the way, there are three times in the Bible where you read about the Scripture being written on both sides. I read you the one in, 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 in Exodus 32. In uh, Zachari uh, Ezekiel chapter number 2, he lists the lamentations and the wrath that's going to come on them on both sides. Come with me to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. The significance of the both side writing is in these things. Revelation chapter 5, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside. Seal with seven seals. That seven seal book written on both sides is when, when Christ opens that, out flows the wrath of God, the seals, the trumpets, and the vials. And they all flow out of that book. I'll bring forth. The curse is going to go forth, and they go forth. And if you go back and look at Exodus 32 where he talks about that, you'll see God's wrath flowing out there. If you go to Ezekiel chapter 2, you'll see the picture of it. Revelation 5 tells you in prophecy, this passage, again, is about that. Now, it's interesting about the curse. Because when you look at the curse, and what the vision is talking about is the judgment that, that is going to take place when the law, the covenant, has been broken. And that curse go, goes forth. And that wrath is, is, is laid out. 
Verse number four, he describes it in a way that reminds you of something back in the book of Leviticus. Turn back to Leviticus chapter 13 with me. Because when you look at something where the houses are consumed, and that's the emphasis there in verse 4, is I, 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 it's going gonna, it's gonna to enter into the house of the thief, and the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall consume it, his house, with the timbers thereof, and the stones thereof. This curse is going to be an all-consuming consumption that destroys everything associated with the satanic policy of evil, the Antichrist and all of his associates. And there is a curse in your Bible that does that. In Leviticus chapter number 14, Leviticus 13 and 14 deal with the issue of leprosy. Leprosy in the Bible is a sign disease. It's a disease that God uses as a sign of, of the corrupting power and the corrupting results of sin. Exodus chapter 4, when God gave Moses two signs, Moses says, how are they going to know you sent me? I said, I'll give you two signs. The first sign was the sign of, uh, of, one of the signs was the sign of leprosy. He took his hand, put it in his robe, pulled it out, and God made that hand leprous. Then he put it back in and pulled it out, and God healed it. And the sign of healing. But the thing that he healed was leprosy. The most deadly, the most demonstrative disease. Because it literally eats, it literally causes flesh to die and corrupt. And it's a sign disease. There are, there's no other disease that has two whole chapters in the Bible dedicated to it. Leviticus 13 and Leviticus 14. Those chapters are not there because leprosy was such a consuming disease during the time. Someone asked me the other day, said he, in, in the Mosaic Law, when he tells Israel, don't eat pork and don't eat lobster and don't eat catfish, is there some health? There was, there was no health benefit or, or, or problem related to any of that. Leviticus, I mean, he says in Leviticus 22 that he did that to make Israel look different. He doesn't say he did, there's not a verse that says he did it for any health benefit. Now, if you can find some health benefit and you think there are some health benefit, fine, but don't blame it on God. Okay? God told Adam and Eve, eat herbs. Then he told Noah, you can eat meat. Somebody says, well, you weren't made to eat meat, so you shouldn't eat meat. If you shouldn't eat meat, God made a mistake telling Noah it was okay for him to do it. Okay? If God told Pete it was okay to eat pork, then it's not a, it's not, there's no health problem in, in eating pork. Otherwise, God would be recommending something bad for him. He, he did it to make them separate. Trying to remember why I got into that. That was that was an excursion. I can't remember why I took it. I just got it off my chest. But the the things that made them different and distinct. Oh, I don't remember now. Look, leprosy. It wasn't leprosy. Wasn't because everybody was getting leprosy, but it's a sign. It was picked out because it's a sign. It's something that carried a message. One of the interesting things about leprosy is that if you look at verse number uh, Leviticus chapter 14, verse 34, he says in the, seven, the first part of the chapter, he says leprosy can get into people. Okay, people can have it. And they're unclean when they do. Verse 34, in the seventh day, in the seventh day, and the priest shall look on the scale. And and behold, I'm in chapter. I'm sorry. I'm in Leviticus 13, Leviticus 14, Leviticus 14, verse uh, 34. When ye shall come into the land of Canaan, which I will give to you for a possession, I will put the plague of leprosy in a house of the land of your possession. Notice how leprosy can not only be in people. 
It can be in the dwelling place, the house. Verse 44, then the priest shall come and look, and behold, if the plague be spread in the house, so it can spread out through the house. It is a fretting leprosy in the house. It is unclean, and he shall break down the house. Watch, the stones of it and the timber thereof and all the mortar of the house, and he shall carry them forth out of the city into an unclean place. So when the leprosy gets in the house, because it came in with the people, it's the stones, the timbers, and even the mortar that holds the stones together. you got to completely annihilate it. That's exactly what we're reading there in Zechariah. Go back and look at chapter 13. Verse number 47, 1347. The garments also that the, the plague of leprosy is in, whether it be woolen garment or, or, or linen garment. Notice the plague gets in, not in the house, in the timber, the stones, the more, in the garment. This is a consuming stuff. If you look back at chapter 13, verse 2, when a man shall have, here, here's how he's going to describe it, shall have in, his skin, in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, or bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy. Notice he describes leprosy as a bright spot. If you go down to verse 42, if there be in, in the bald head or the bald uh, forehead a white, reddish sore. So you've got this white spot, and it gets all festered and, and, and all red and infected. And that's, what, that's how you identify leprosy. Come with me to Revelation chapter number 16. Revelation 16. When those, when that curse goes forth out of that book in Revelation 5, written on both sides, and the seals go out and they're open into the trumpets, and then the vials come out, chapter 15 and 16. Revelation 16, verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And if you notice verse 1, he says, Go thy way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God. So here's God's wrath being poured out. Here's the curse going forth into the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore. You know it has been noisome sore. You ever have a sore just <laughs> it was just, just boiling, running, wouldn't quit. It's nasty. Grievous. Notice upon the men which had the mark of the beast. And upon them which worshipped his image. When they went out and got that mark of the beast. By the way, look at chapter 13. Verse 2. And the beast which I saw, this is talking about the Antichrist, was like a leopard. His feet were as the feet of, the bear, of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And a dragon gave him great power and his seat and great authority. And there he is down in the verses after that, speaking great words of blasphemy. Verse 5, speaking great things and blasphemy and so forth. Notice that the Antichrist, when he's described as an animal, he's described as a leopard. Then he has the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion, but he's a leopard. You remember what Jeremiah chapter 23 said about a leopard? Jeremiah 13 said about a leopard? Can a leopard change his what? Spots. You know how you identify a leper? A leopard is by his spots. 
And when they get that mark of the beast, that spot of the beast, when the wrath of God comes out, those birds that have got that spot, that mark of the beast, God puts a spot of leprosy on them. And their garments, that's why Jude verse 23 talks about don't touch the garment that's spotted. Keep your garments. Listen, you're talking about something where God's literally going to consume these people, consume the flesh off their body in judgment. The only thing they'll be fit for is to be consumed. Come with me to two passages, three passages, four passages. Got to quit thinking of Isaiah 5. We'll quit. When he says he's going to consume them, he's talking about burning them up. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 24. Here's the curse. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their roots shall be as rottenness, and their blue, uh, blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the Holy One of Israel. It won't go well for those who've cast aside God's law. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah 5, verse 14. Wherefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the, the Lord God of hosts, because we, ye spake this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth. There goes the roll, the scroll, fire. And this people would, and it shall devour them. You remember what John the Baptist said about the Lord Jesus? That he that comes after me, I said, I baptize you with water, but he that cometh after me baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. And he'll gather the, the wheat into the garner, and then he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's what God's telling them. They may be God's nation. They may be going back in, into the land and building that temple and rebuilding that city. But if they don't go there in faith trusting God's word and they, they're involved in that vain religious system, the next time when we get that, the, the, the vision of the flying ephah, You'll see that Israel is not through with Babylon. They're not through with the vain religious system. It's still going to be there all the way to the end. And if they get involved in that, that curse is on them. So Israel is in a position where they, they still have to deal with that fifth course of judgment. And that nation, and God's going to, you see, in chapter 2 he, talked, he called it the Holy Land. And he's going to consume all those unholy, all those defiled people out of the land. And he's going to fly that scroll across. The, he's going to fly his word out there, make it plain. This is the option. And then he's going to separate the wheat from the tares. Okay? All right. We've done another vision. I was coming back the other day, and a fellow asked me, he says, you're a preacher, so tell me, I had a dream last night, and he told me this. He said, what's all that mean? I said, I think you had some bad artichokes in your salad. <laughs> what? It didn't mean anything. It don't mean anything. You, you know. McGee said, you just had some bad pizza. I said, I think that's probably. But these visions mean something. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, for the privilege we have of, of just stepping aside and looking at it. And we know as we look at these things, 
as I said earlier, even if if we're wrong about all this understanding, don't have it all right, and we know we never do, we're really not going to be there, but you will. Because we can read these things and see how you've planned and worked and intend to do. Honor your son, honor yourself. It encourages us to trust you. We thank you for that privilege in Christ's name. Amen.